Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Tom Lee is breaking his recent streak of silence. Silence on CNBC, but also on X following the Fed's 50 basis point rate cut. And I, I have to say, Tom Lee is one of, if not the biggest bulls that you will find out there. But he doesn't sound nearly as bullish as he used to. And even... The host here on CNBC kind of calls that out. I would love for you guys to take a look at this and let me know what you think. To our talk of the tape, how much more can stocks rise? Let's ask Tom Lee. He's Fundstrat's head of research and CNBC contributor, live with us once again at Post 9. Nice to see you. Great to see you, Scott. You know, since the Fed did their jumbo cut, the market really hasn't done all that much except for one day last Thursday. Why? Uh, well, you know, I think the Fed unleashed... Uh, us on an easing cycle, and that's going to be positive. We know it's actually historically positive three months, six months out. But what stocks do in the next month is a bit of a coin flip, and I think that's what we're seeing because there's some repositioning that took place. And also we're now thinking about the 40 days into the election. So does the fact that the election is but 40 days away sort of ruin the perfect scenario for stocks to get that post-Fed bump? I, I think it delays it, um, just because uh, you know, in in the conferences that I've been speaking to, speaking at and seeing wealth managers and family offices, a lot don't want to commit capital until after election day, and it, I don't think it matters who wins. It's just they want to get that event behind them. Oh, so you think we're going to have sort of a dash to the finish uh, after election day is is out of the way? Yeah, and that's pretty typical. You know, in fact, uh, in in election years, the November, December rallies are pretty tremendous. And in fact, when markets are up more than 10 percent in the first half, you also get big rallies November, December, sort of choppy through September. You think investors are sold on the idea that this economy is going to make it? It's going to make it through. The Fed's going to pull this off. Is any of what we've witnessed since Fed Day doubts about the bigger picture? Uh, so far, so good. This Friday, we get core PCE, and hopefully that confirms inflation is no longer on the front burner. But I'd say one thing I've noticed is that the number of investors and professional money managers that think we're already in a recession is very high. And so I think the evidence just has to be better than expected. And I think those views shift back to soft landing. When we've seen, you know, recently targets for the S&P, Brian Belsky, I keep bringing him up because he's the most recent to raise his target up to the highest now on the street. I've asked you about, you know, the market lately. You haven't sounded like you, you'd be raising your own target to a degree like that, would you? Uh, you know, I, I think there is a lot of upside in the foreseeable future. Let's say three, six months out. But for someone to tactically say, we need to pin a 6,000 target and then put money to work today, I think it's harder to make that case because valuations um, aren't on the cheaper end. And we've already had a, a fairly sizable move. So I'm not saying I'm like bearish right now, but to me, uh, I'm, I'd have a lot more confidence saying three, six months out, things are attractive, especially things went like margin debt, right? It's it actually decreased in August, meaning investors have been deleveraging. Mm -hmm. It hasn't gone anywhere for the last four months at a time when markets are rising. I guess, I guess my point would be, it would have been better articulated to just say, you don't sound as bullish as you usually are. Is that fair? Uh, you know, yes, I'm I'm bullish into year end, but I'm I'm a little less confident about how we how markets behave into election day. And that, not that I think we're going to have a huge drawdown. Um, if we do have a big drawdown, you know, I'd be buying that dip. But I I also don't think we can make new highs, and then and then see the market blast off after election day. So I'd rather sort of say. Things look a lot better after Election Day. Can we make new highs if, if tech doesn't resume its leadership role in anywhere close to the degree that it had? Um, as long as tech is a market perform, if tech actually declines, that's going to be hard for the rest of the S&P 500 to compensate. But what we've seen so far, including the days like NVIDIA and Tesla recently, is that, it, that tech is actually holding its own, but other stocks are starting to show uh, catalysts and signs of life. Yeah. What about the broadening trade? I mean, look, you look at the Russell, your big call, uh, of course, week to date's down more than 1%. Really hasn't done much at all. I, I kept hearing, hey, you got to wait till the Fed cuts. Then you go into the Russell. I don't know. What do you think? Well, Russell had a big week last week. Uh, it's some profit taking now. But I, I think that there's, you know, this is what bottoms look like. 
Um, I don't think bottoms are straight up. I know in 2021, energy was bottoming and it was also very choppy, but eventually made not only new highs, but then basically had a blistering gain in 2020 in the year following. So I think that's a multi-year start for the Russell. It feels choppy, but we're still near all-time highs and there's a, there's a big fundamental case to own small caps. Some have made the case that there are a lot of areas of the market that are overcrowded at this point. So many different sectors have gone up a bunch. You look at industrials and utilities and other things that have traded near or at highs. Therefore, they find better uh, value in bonds. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think a bond investor is buying a bond different for a different reason than buying an equity. <clears throat> because an equity gives you not only inflation protection uh, and benefit from falling yields, but also capital appreciation and positive surprise. Bonds rarely give you positive surprise. I think a bond investor uh, should, I mean, someone should have some income with some capital upside there, but there are so many good opportunities. And, you know, the fact that China has started to actually perform better and potentially broken out that's, again, a, a Brent signal because that's, a, that's been a big drag for the last few years. Oh, how about that? Do, do you feel like the move that happened in China this week's a game changer on how we should view what, you know, the potential turn in their economy means for the overall markets? I mean, we've seen certain stocks get a nice boost, some of the luxury goods companies, right? LVMH, Estee Lauder, et cetera. And the gaming stocks. What about in the bigger picture? Uh... You know, it's hard to tell what's a trading rally versus a bottom for China. Uh, I spent some time talking to Mark Newton, our technical strategist. He thinks this is a bona fide breakout. And it is coming on the heels of not only stimulus, but in the face of unrelenting bad news for China. So to me, a rally on bad news is a sign that maybe the worst is already priced into China. And that means it could rally for a while. All right. Now, again, first and foremost, just to kind of clear some of these things up, Tom Lee says after three to six months, post fed rate cut markets are are higher and that's not true when the fed cuts 25 basis points and there's no recession that's true okay markets are higher three six 12 24 months later post 25 basis point cut with no um recession when the fed cuts 50 basis points in fact markets tend to be lower three six 12 24 36 48 months later because most of the time, historically speaking, in recent history, when the Fed cuts 50 basis points, it's because there's already a pretty severe problem. And we ultimately enter into a recession shortly thereafter. And unfortunately, this time is starting to look pretty damn similar to other recessionary periods in the past. And really, if you want to boil this down, if the Fed is cutting rates as unemployment is falling that's good markets higher if the fed is cutting rates as the unemployment rate is rising historically that has been negative for markets because it's really hard to stop a rise in the unemployment rate and it tends to just keep going now what we're seeing in the manufacturing sector is really worrying you have ts lombard you have some others that are starting to point this out that are also in the bull the bull camp the soft landing camp saying we might have a problem here in manufacturing or aka factory jobs so i think there is some you know discrepancies here that that should be cleared up now the other thing i want to point out is is tom lee said between now and the election he he finds it hard to get more upside and and i really like how he put this because i agree with it even though I'm in the 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 bear camp, firm recession camp at this point, seems like every day there's more validation to the recession camp. And trust me, I'm looking for different areas that I could be wrong and to poke holes in my thesis. But but Tom Lee says he's basically cautious between now and the election because if markets stay at all time highs, if markets keep going higher into the election, it's pretty hard to imagine a scenario where markets rip higher like they historically do after an election. Now, if we're in a recession, markets do not typically rip higher after an election. We've seen this in 2008. Markets did not rip higher after the election. In fact, you ended up proceeding to fall to the lows of the global financial crisis recession around early 2009. So in fact, you did not get that end of the year rally. But if we are not in a recession, then it's safe to say we probably get 
an end of the year rally. Okay. I don't think the case, you know, for recessions or for a soft landing, it's going to be strong enough to get you a big rally um, after the election. At this point, given where markets are at, given the pricing of markets, like there's a 0% chance of a recession priced in. Do I think economic data gets better or worse from now until the election? It probably gets worse. Okay. So after the election, why would markets rally even higher? You know, I, I can't find the case for that. Now, if we get a 5 10% pullback before the election, could you rally pretty aggressively after the election and kind of come back to where we are now? Potentially. But that also means we need to see an election correction, okay? And that's that's kind of what, you know, Tom Lee is, is, is getting at here. Now, this is the clip I'm very excited to share with you as well because in this market, there's there's... Gosh, I've, I've never seen a market like this where like 90, 95% of investors are positioned and actively talking about one potential outcome, which right now is a soft landing. You have five to 10% of market participants that are like, okay, guys, we could be entering into a recessionary period here. Like it's so off sides. It's, it's crazy. And it's pretty rare to get a full bear take on markets, but we just got one. It's from Stifles Barry Bannister. Now, I actually shared his analysis here on the channel a couple of days ago, and they obviously brought him on CNBC because it did get quite a bit of attention because let's be honest, if you're a bear right now or if you're semi-cautious on markets, it's like, what the heck are you doing? The Fed just cut rates 50 basis points when in all reality, you should be very cautious right now, judging off of history. Nonetheless, they brought him on CNBC. He, he, he shares his take, and I agree with... Basically, everything he says is like what what I've been saying. He says, well, I guess the headline of this article is titled, Investors Should Be Cautious Going Into the Late Third and Fourth Quarter. Take a listen to this. Welcome back to Power Lunch. The S&P 500 hit a record high again today, earlier on, following its 41st record close of the year last night. But don't get too comfortable. Stocks are lower this session now, but our next guest is also expecting an S&P correction to the low 5,000s by the fourth quarter, or about a 10% drop from here. Let's bring in Stiefel Chief Equity Strategist Barry Bannister. Barry, don't pop our balloons. Everyone's saying it's going to look kind of kind of good into year end. Why don't you think so? Well, there's a lot of enthusiasm right now. There's no question. Um, a number of the economic indicators, some of the conference board readings, such as present conditions versus expect expectations of conditions, the weakness and the breadth of the non-farm payrolls, what's called a diffusion index, the um, jobs plentiful versus hard to get heading down, meaning we've eroded some of that excess supply on labor demand, um, and uh, a bottoming out of unit labor costs. This is going to affect upside for inflation. When you add it all together, it's a slowing economy, particularly on the job side. There's a lot of optimism out there, and the market's expensive. So we would certainly urge caution going into the late third and then fourth quarter. So if I could translate, tell me if I've gotten this right. You think we're going to have headlines about a labor slowdown, headlines about maybe sticky uh, wages or um, some sort of lingering inflationary pressures that perhaps constrain the Fed of being able to deliver the now half point or 75 basis points of cuts that are priced into the market. Uh, mm -hmm. Have I got that right? Yeah, if you look at futures, uh, December 2025 Fed funds futures, they're slightly below 3%. Well, it's very hard to justify getting below 3% without a slowdown. Uh, and if we don't have any slowdown, if we continue to utilize these limited resources that we have, then what you would end up is a no landing scenario where rates and yields should not be dramatically lower. So I don't have any problem with the views of the, and I haven't had a problem with views of the Fed uh, being more dovish in 2024. It's what people expect in 2025 that started to be priced in uh, and the 31% year-to-year gain in the S&P 500, everything just feels very frothy. So you've got, uh, you say, a near three-generation high in the S&P 500 PE and the growth versus value relative outperformance uh, sounds, uh, but has never been higher, I guess. Uh, and that has always presaged a recession and a bear market. Mm-hmm. 
Well, we look at the growth rate of growth relative to value. So you take the growth index with dividends and you divide it by the value index, and that's just growth relative to value. Uh, then we do the growth rate of that index. And that way you can calculate how much the growth managers have walloped the value managers in the last 10 years. 10 year compounded, they beat them by over 7%. Uh, they outperform them by 100% at a 7 Kager compound annual growth rate. Uh, it's been miserable if you were a value portfolio manager for the past 10, 12 years. However, since that financial crisis low in 09 to now, you've gotten in line with growth versus value to where you were in late 99, early 2000. I was there. You were there. Not as many people were in this business 25 years ago when we were at these levels. And uh, we know what a prolonged bull market looks like. We've had one. It lasted about as long as the one off the Reagan years into 1999-2000, and trees don't grow to the sky. So when we look at valuation, we look at all the things that we do. Um, we're very quantitative and we're very pictorial. Yeah. Uh, we show this market is expensive. Barry, the thing that to me is, is more worrisome, as much I, like I don't want a near-term correction, but do you believe we're expected to see lower forward returns over literally you know, an, another decade or two. We've heard, and I have, maybe I haven't been doing it 25 years, but I've heard a lot about long, lower returns in the future that have never yet panned out. Do you think this time is going to be different? Well, as long as I do this, I mean, I'm, I'm almost 40 years now, so it's kind of getting a little bit um, old and tedious. But um, the uh, the thing I would say about it is, is that we're looking at about 6% returns for the 10 years, 10, ended 2035. We get there through various measures, such as equity risk premium, which would take a long time to explain. What's easier to explain is that the price earnings ratio now in the mid 20s will drop on trailing earnings to about 18 times. The earnings will comfortably double. They've comfortably doubled every 10 years for decades, and there's nothing that we see that wouldn't lead to another double. Uh, so double the earnings, take the multiple down. You're looking at about a 6% return for 10 years including dividends reinvested. Mm -hmm. So price only, maybe four. Um, that's not going to make a lot of baby boomers and post-baby boomers retirement plans whole. So enjoy, you know, enjoy this while it lasted, but uh, investing is about to get a lot more difficult. I don't know. I, that, maybe the multiple is going to be, if the multiple is okay, because, you know, we're the best you know, horse in the global markets and the companies are going to get more productive thanks to AI, I don't know if I mm -hmm. want to say multiple expansion, but maybe it hangs in there. Yeah, well, there's no doubt that the AI, which is, uh, I think, this is apostasy, but I, I think it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. Sure. It's just a better way to use the data we already had on the Internet. The Internet was revolutionary. Fiber optics and telecom was revolutionary. Um, and so... I think this is evolutionary. It's been hyped up. Um, right. I don't think it lends itself to the monopolies that allow the enormous returns, both cash and uh, and uh, and earnings, in tech companies. In yeah. other words, having an AI position is probably better for society than it is for a monopolist like social media meta right. or search, Alphabet, Google. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting to watch this general purpose technology develop. But so far, to me, it just looks evolutionary. Now you're making us all feel scared again. It's not Halloween yet. Uh, Barry, thanks for joining us, though, to break it down. So I thought that was a very uh, fascinating take, I guess, these days. You don't hear many opinion pieces like that that are decisively more negative and, let's face it, more realistic. You know, I get a lot of hate for being cautious right now and the problem is not the recession the problem is not a slowdown if you are an equity investor right if your goal is to make money in stocks who gives a crap about a recession or you know a, a slower growth environment let's let's face that fact nobody gives a crap about that it depends on where markets are priced right if markets are priced for 20 percent eps growth for next year like they are right now and it's very unlikely we're gonna get that in fact we could go into a recession that's the problem that's where the danger comes in because it's 
the only thing that matters is where you buy a stock. You could have bought, again, I use this analogy all the time. If you bought Cisco at $4 per share in 1998, it's a $60, almost $60 company right now. You have made almost 1,500% on your investment. If you bought Cisco just 18 months later in 1999 at $58 a share or $62 a share, whatever the high was, around $62 a share, you're still negative, right? So it's vitally important where you buy things based on forward expectations and right now the expectations are very high for this what seems like perfect economy right that's the expectation is the economy is going to be damn near perfect next year and the reality of the data that we are seeing is quite the opposite we are not looking at a perfect economy next year we could be looking at a recessionary economy now i i would be bullish on markets if 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 the s p was down 25 percent from here I'd be bullish on markets just like I was in 2022 because markets were pricing in bad things, right? And and the risk was then of a 90% chance that the markets were overpricing in bad bad news, overpricing in risk, and a 10% chance that markets were, you know, uh correct correctly pricing it, right? The 10% chance that things got even worse than what they did in 2022, economically speaking. Whereas now I see there's a 90 plus percent chance that markets are overpriced, that we under deliver next year, and a 10% chance that we over deliver on economic activity and earnings. And that's not an ideal situation to be in. The, the larger the disconnect, the larger the decline. The, the more you're pricing in good news, the less of it that you do get, the more downside you will see. It's as simple as this. And if you understand markets, equity markets, I consider all of you guys equity strategists. OK, that's 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 kind of fancier terminology for saying you invest in stocks. You are active doing this craft each and every single day. I think all of you can understand what I'm saying here. I, I don't think this is too complicated. I think this is um, maybe associate degree like information in economics we're not going too far in depth here it's expectations are here realities down here and markets are way the fuck up here excuse my excuse my my french okay this this topic is is kind of irritating right um because there's so many wall streeters let's just say wall streeters that are guiding people in a false delusional reality because why wall street gets paid if you invest if you don't invest they don't get paid nearly as much so wall street makes a lot more money if people are bullish heading into a crisis rather than if people are bearish or defensive heading into a crisis and my job my self-described job what i say to myself is I don't care who likes it or who doesn't, I am going to say it how it is and I'm going to be the first one to do so. And I confidently can say I'm one of, if not the first person in this, this you know, sphere that we're in that was very bullish, that turned bearish, decisively bearish and cautious, cautious if you will. And I'm not afraid to tell you that. And when things do flip, to you know being good or maybe if i'm wrong if if the 10 percent chance i'm wrong is actually realized then i'll be the first to let you know this is you know a, a golden opportunity but i don't see any upside surprise for this economy unless you get massive like stimulus like some kind of crazy government spending but at that point you're going to get a lot of inflation so how much of a positive really is it or if real estate starts to move if people start to buy and sell homes, that is the upside for this economy. That's the very clear upside for this economy. If you look at active listings, you've tripled since March of 2022. Okay, great, fine. Homes are going onto the market. The problem is they're not selling. The real estate data that we're seeing is just really bad. And even you can see here, the purchase versus refinance index the purchase index in blue is down 60% from where it was during that same time period. So there was a lot of people looking to buy homes when there was a third of the homes on the market as there is today. And now there's three times the amount of homes listed, AKA more supply. 
and there's 60% less people looking to actively buy a home. So you have supply way up here, you have demand way down here. If price is the middle, you start to compress these things. If the labor if if the labor market does weaken further and people are forced to sell homes, they start selling those homes for lower prices. That creates a very unfavorable wealth effect for the economy and for people's spending habits, okay? But in the scenario that the Fed is fast enough, they cut rates fast enough, which honestly, I, I even with the 75 basis points of cuts we're expecting between now and year end, that would be 125 basis points cumulatively in 2024. I don't think that's fast enough to get real estate moving the way we need it to move at a critical inflection point in the economy like right now. We need real estate to start moving now. There is on average $299,000 of equity in the average homeowner's home. Now, if you live in Michigan, $299,000 is more expensive than the average home in Michigan, or not average home, depends on the, the areas, right? The median home in Michigan's like 240,000 or so, 250,000 or so. So that's not a generalized statistic for everywhere. But as a generalized statistic would say, generally speaking, if people are able to sell their homes, they're going to get a lot of money in the bank and they're going to be able to spend a lot of money. And people love to spend. Okay. So that's kind of the upside surprise with this economy. Other than that, I, I can't find anything else to say that's a tailwind for markets as we're expecting 20% EPS growth next year and basically a flawless economy. I, 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 I don't see it. You're going to have to state your bull case down below in the comment section and please do not tell me rate cuts are the fix to everything because they are not. The rate cut is trying to fix a problem, right? Uh, the problem is the economy is starting to hemorrhage jobs in the manufacturing sector, okay? People are not confident enough to go spend money because they're starting to know people that are actively starting to lose their jobs or get their hours reduced. The cost of living has, I would say, went up 40% instead of the government's numbers, which are like 22, 23% over the past, you know, four years. People are hurting. They don't have money. Auto delinquency rates are at the highest level they have been at for prime borrowers. These are credit scores between 680 and 780 at the highest level since 2009. I mean, I I, I can't make a bullish case off that. Um, not with markets at all-time highs. If stocks were down 25%, I would say, hey, maybe the economy doesn't weaken as much as we're expecting. You know, maybe the Fed um it prevents too much weakness right maybe we don't ultimately go into a recession but the problem is with markets at all-time highs with where expectations are we don't even need to go into a recession to get a lot of downside if it looks like we're heading into a recession we're gonna get 20 25 downside once the consensus flips from 90 percent soft landing to 90 percent you know bear market 90 percent you know recession camp or even anything close to that, like 50, 60, 70% of people in the recession camp, you're going to see equity markets that are down a lot. If we go into a recession, then I think that's kind of priced in at that point, right? Question is, do we go into a bad recession? If we go into a bad recession, you're going to get 35 to 65% downside. Now, I'm not in that camp. So, I'm, I don't even know if we're going to technically go into a recession with the government data the way it is, the, just how manipulated it is. We may not go into an actual recession on paper, but you're going to feel this in corporate earnings. You're going to feel this slowdown in the economic data to some degree. It's, it's going to get worse from here, even if we don't go into a technical recession. And from that standpoint, I think markets are mispriced for the risk. And that's all this really comes down to. So I think there's better buying opportunities to come. And I do like his perspective, even though I think there's just like cautious, just being cautious, at least 15 to 20% downside from here, at least. Like it could be more than that, but at least 15, 20%, I would feel more comfortable um, going in different areas in our markets. Just my take. Let me know what you guys think down below in the comment section. I apologize for the rant, but sometimes you just got to get ranted on. 
and uh, hopefully it, it 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 sounds good to uh, hear someone like myself that will say these things that a lot of Wall Street is scared to say right now because they can't right they're they're gonna take in less deposits they're gonna make less on their management fees they can't go out and scare people that does that that makes zero sense for them to do that and that's why they're not doing that and that's why everyone's sticking with the soft landing thesis which at this point i don't think there's much of a soft landing thesis to really be had maybe i'm missing it but uh the, yeah it, it just doesn't look that likely at this point so let me know what you guys think about this information down below in the comment section i could probably go on another 30 minutes or so just ranting and sharing statistics but i'll spare you the time i think we got the gist of it out here in this video Again, let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you guys want to come trade with us live in real time as well. Check out that link down below in the description of this video to come join the trading community. At the same time, support the channel because I don't sell you things. I don't have fees. And uh, we just try to keep this as open, honest, transparent as humanly possible. We all make mistakes, but I'll bet your ass I'm not wrong on this. Not wrong. The timing? Who knows? I think between November, December, January, February, March, these next five months after October, I think things will hold up between now and the election. After election, into spring, that's where you want to be a little bit more defensive. So you guys have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.